Uh, we will start off with, uh, I was about to say, most exciting part, but then I looked at Bennett, and of course that's uh, unfair, <laughs> but um, talking about uh, soft therapy. So welcome to the two of you. Yeah. I think um, you can do a better job of just introducing yourself with two sentences that I can, yes. so I will leave it uh, to you. Yeah. Welcome Thank and thanks for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank I'll you. Yeah. briefly just mention that I would like everyone not to take their phones up during this presentation because you will miss out on so much. So keep your phones in your pockets and keep chewing instead. So <clears throat> we've invited Danielle and Jakob, thank you so much for coming both of you. Thanks for having to us. To share Thanks. a really prime example, I would say, of how dialogue between a very proactive patient caretaker and a very engaged researcher and scientist can lead to the creation of an international patient organization, peer-reviewed scientific articles co-authored by patients and scientists, and last but not least, some groundbreaking discoveries uh, in research that uh, Daniela and Jakob will share with you. You'll be talking most of the time, but you are both engines, so I will from time to time interrupt to make sure we get through some of the highlights of your story. So many of you will know Jakob. He's uh, heading up our stem cells research, and he's, I would say, the personification of, um, of human-centered research development, research and development. And Danielle, uh, she'll take it away herself, I'm sure. So Danielle, please, could yes. you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. And first of all, thank you so much for inviting me today. My name is Danielle and I'm the executive director of Ketotic Hypoglycemia International, which is a family organization uh, reaching all over the globe for families impacted by idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia, which is simply a medical mystery. We don't know why children and patients suffer from unexplained low blood sugar and high ketones, but that's something that we are trying to figure out together. So thank you for having me. And You're also the mother. Of course, yeah. yes, yes, that's why I founded this organization after my son was found in a hypoglycemic coma when he was two days old. I first uh, got introduced to the term hypoglycemia. I thought that 0 0.8 was a great blood sugar, <laughs> but uh, apparently it wasn't. And after that, I really dived into medical literature to try to find answers when the doctors couldn't. Uh, trying to figure out all of the diseases causing ketotic hypoglycemia. And that's where I found myself in the communities already existing on Facebook. I found the diabetes communities in Denmark, the support groups for families impacted by type 1 diabetes. Because they were the only one I knew understood the term hypoglycemia. And that's where Jacob found me. Yeah. And I'm Jacob Peterson, and as, as some of you know, and I'm heading up uh, at Novo Nordisk, our stem cell units. Then in my spare time, I'm involved in a couple of patients' organizations, uh, uh, JDIF and uh, Ketotic Hypoglycemia International. And uh, I have six kids and a dog. And uh, I have one kid with uh, type 1 diabetes. And uh, having worked in type 1 diabetes for my entire life, that was something of a realization then to get it uh, a little bit closer than just doing research and making drugs, but we can discuss that a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. Because before we dive into the story, since we have a lot of people here working with healthcare systems, could you just briefly share, both of you, what, in your opinion, needs to change in healthcare systems today? Of course, the way you prioritize, uh, but I think a very important thing that needs to change, that is patient involvement. You know, for, for, for decades, patients has been I wouldn't call them innocent bystanders, but they have been bystanders to the treatment that doctors and, and uh, pharma companies like us are either prescribing or developing. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying uh, at Novo Nordisk, as you know, through the deep summits to engage with patients. Uh, but if we are honest and look at the impact the patients have on what we are doing, the impact patients have on the treatment at hospitals, it is minimal. It is it's, it's to a place where I think it's, uh, it's a little bit outrageous. I think that we are all here because we want to make better medicines for the patients we serve. And I think the doctors are saying the same things. They are here for the patients. But they just don't, in my mind, involve the patients sufficiently. They don't listen to them. They don't do science together with them. And, and I can say from my part, 
maybe don't before you get it really close, understand what it is the patients need. So I think we need to spend more time in the healthcare system, including pharma, to understand what it is our patients want from us. From your perspective, Daniel? Yes, I would take it up a notch. Jacob is talking about patient involvement, but I would say we need to talk about co-creation because co-created research and co-creating with families will create a whole different synergy because they will suddenly be equal stakeholders. The doctors can be experts on the medicine, on the clinical side, but we need to recognize these families actually as experts on the lived experience with the disease. And with, if we are looking at KHI and the work we are doing in our patient organization, we could talk about doctors' involvement in the patient's research. I think they would be pretty upset about that. So I think let's move away from patient involvement. So dive, let's dive into uh, your story, your joint story. Would you, would you start, Daniel? Yes. What happened? Yes. Well, Jacob found me. I was asking a bunch of very desperate and, uh, questions. So will we die of hypoglycemia? Can there be a type of diabetes causing hypoglycemia with no high blood sugars? And Jacob reached me and asked me if I needed to talk because I sound a bit frustrated and, to say the least, a bit uneducated on diabetes. <laughs> and then uh, I had a chat with Jacob and then it started out as, a, as me when I had talked to my children's professor. He's a, very, he, he's a children's doctor, but he's very much a professor. So he talked in medical language and I didn't understand any of it. So when I had talked to my children's professor, I went to Jacob to ask, please, Jacob, can you translate this? Can you tell me what he said? And then Jacob tried to tra translate it. And after a while, I started to understand both my professor and I started to be able to ask Jacob some questions not only related to what does it mean, this mean. And then I had an incident with my son, Noah. He just got a Dexcom and my the ch my children's doctor said, now you need to sleep and trust that the CGM will alarm when the blood sugar drops. And the first night I slept throughout the whole night, I was amazed when I wake up because there were no alarms. It was simply a perfect line and the blood sugar should be 4.7. But my son was unconscious and his blood sugar was 1.7. And I felt so much, um, I called 911, but afterwards, after he was stabilized, I was like, oh, okay, so this is the, the treatment, this is the monitoring side, so I should just trust this and then my son will die while he's, while he's sleeping. And I was so frustrated that I went to Jacob and said, so what are we going to do about it? And he said, well, I don't know, but let's figure it out. <laughs> and then uh, we took a deep dive into medical literature and we found a, a study made in Cambridge where they were training hypoglycemia dogs. And that was the first project we started because the current studies on hypoglycemia dogs are very, very poor and they, are, they don't have a statistic power which could really prove that the dogs could actually detect hypoglycemia. So we went to my children's doctor and in a collaboration we started the first project which is can dogs detect hypoglycemia in children with type 1 diabetes and ketotic hypoglycemia. So that yeah. was really the, the first project we started. Yeah. And, and, and from my perspective, uh, you know, I've, since I'm involved in JDIF, I do a lot of counseling for parents, not medical counseling, because I'm not allowed, but uh, I do a lot of counseling in terms of, you know, how is it to get a child with type 1 diabetes? I actually spend quite a bit of time. And as Danielle said, she had nowhere else to go with the disease uh, she and her children has. Uh, than a type 1 diabetes form because that was the only thing that has worked within, uh, you know, uncontrolled hypoglycemia. Uh, and and uh, from scientifically, I saw Danielle also personally was a really uh, interesting case. Uh, she is like a dual cell rabbit. Once she gets, uh, once she gets going, she really gets going. And that was, that was actually really motivating for me to help a person that really want to make a difference. And, and that was very clear with Danielle. She didn't understand anything initially, but I can tell you, I, I would look at Danielle now in just the three years uh, uh, we have been on this journey. She knows more about the disease than most medical doctors that are treating patients with the disease. And that's why, again, patient involvement, patient, 
patient-driven research is uh, so important. And I agree with you, it's not just patient involvement. Thanks. It's actually doctor involvement in the patient-driven research. So, so we should turn it around uh, like we have done uh, with Danielle spearheading this in the Ketotic Hyperglycemia International. Turn it completely around. That is actually the patients dri driving the research and not the doctors. The doctors are then put on as facilitators and help us later on. But Danielle, you told me earlier that in the beginning you didn't even have the words to ask the right questions. No. So you had questions, but maybe Jacob understood them, but yeah. most of the other scientists and professors didn't. No. So. I, I use quite a lot of time uh, uh, before each session with the doctor to try to formulate my questions so he would understand what I actually meant. And I used a lot of time uh, reading to to form my questions so they would understand it uh, but I was often in a situation where I simply did not have the words because I have a bachelor in social education in Danish I was a pedagogue I had no clue at all about any medical language and then I came in I was like dropped in this uh, foreign world where everyone talked a different language than I did so having this, um, I felt like Jacob was holding my hand when I was blindfolded through a world where everyone knew each other and everyone knew what everyone was saying, but slowly... Except the patients. Except the, <laughs> except the patients. But, but I was in a situation where there were no patients. I was the patient. My children were the patient. After my daughter was diagnosed, they found that my ADHD diagnosis wasn't actually ADHD. I suffered from dangerously low blood sugar and high ketones, it hadn't been detected. So I had been pumping myself with, with medicine for ADHD and the doctors didn't know, well, why, why is it not helping you? I don't know. But going back at the medical records, we can see that I had incidents with like hypoglycemia, which was recorded at the hospital, but no doctor dared to tell me. I just want you to share because that was one of the strange surprises to me. What is the treatment currently for your children? It's, uh, it's Mycena, modified cornstarch. And how much? A lot. My children, they have D-tubes in their stomach. Because the D-tube is basically a port from the outside into your stomach. Yeah, so we can pump them with this cornstarch constantly. They, they will not survive a night without the cornstarch. They will be unconscious in the morning due to hypoglycemia. And it's very interesting because I have two children with idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia. My son is severely hypoglycemic. He cannot go a few hours without having a very, very bad blood sugar. But my daughter, she will be so ketotic even if her blood sugar is semi-okay. So her, her biggest issue is ketoacidosis. So she can be admitted in ketoacidosis with a normal blood sugar. And me, I'm, I'm kind of in between. So we are medical mystery, and the, and the scale of idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia goes from the child who has vomited for three days and they are being admitted because they will have a low blood sugar and high ketones, to the children who are continuously through a port being pumped with dextrose because they cannot survive without. I, I want, because we are short on time, as always, yeah. we could spend hours here. Maybe, could you just sketch out, Jakob, some of the discoveries you've done together? Yeah, so, so basically the discoveries we have done together is Danielle who has, uh, who, who has done it. But, but I think that <coughs> <coughs> one of the most amazing things was that when we started this journey just a few years ago, we saw it was just a few patients in Denmark that suffered from this. Danielle and maybe some families on, in the Ferry Island and then some people in the U.S., you know, rare, rare disease. But what we have discovered after Danielle have started the patient organization is that that doesn't seem to be the case. So through questionnaires and people like Danielle looking up on the internet, low blood glucose, a lot of patients have come to Danielle and the patient's organization because they have gone through the hospitals, been admitted and just been sent home, you know, Either you're not treating your trial in the right way, you know, uh, or you have epilepsy, or you know, all kind of... Or the mom has Munchausen by yeah, or the mom, Yeah, so all kind of horrible diagnosis because the doctors don't know what the symptoms are and how to react. 
That is changing now because uh, Danielle and the organizations in developing international treatment guidelines and, and how to recognize these patients. But along the way, and I just want to uh, tell you this fantastic discovery that gives... It He's very excited. You know, it gives me goosebumps because <laughs> along the way, Danielle, she calls me up and said, it's funny, we are getting a lot of patients that have Down syndrome. And I just thought, yeah, Down syndrome, you know, is a conglomerate of unfortunate bad diagnosis together with, you know, mental impairment and what is it's horrible. Not disease because it is a disease, it's a genetic disease, as you know, right? And Danielle said, I don't think this is a coincidence. And then she said, like like the, the person says, let's do a survey. And then we did uh, or not we, Danielle did a we. yeah, a targeted survey to down uh, patients with Down syndrome. And it turned out there was a significant overrepresentation. And you know, I don't know if you know patients with Down syndrome, some of them do really well, some of them do really poorly, they don't get out of bed, they don't develop languages, and so on and so forth. And what Danielle then discovered through some of the mothers contacting her was that there were patients, uh, uh, individuals with Down syndrome, that were laying in bed, you know, a few years old, not having a language, not having ability to move around. And after this, she did the patient survey and she found out overrepresentation. And now we have published a paper where a significant portion of patients with Down syndrome, at least preliminary, seems to suffer from low blood glucose. And many of these patients that are case studies now have been treated, have now developed language, have now developed the ability to walk and get out of bed, and are not laying in bed with seizures because of low blood glucose. So we're talking about an impact on thousands and thousands of patients worldwide with not a simple treatment because even though cornstarch is a relatively simple treatment, is constantly, as Danielle tries to explain. And that is, you know, it gives me goosebumps that a patient organization, patient-driven research, patient-driven questionnaires, now are awakening the scientific community. So they are going in and say, what's going on with these down patients? How can we treat them better? What is the reason for the symptoms they are having? And so on, through a research done in a patient's organization and published in a peer review journal. I think that is the best example I've ever seen of citizen science. and. The outcome, you know, if, if I were a scientist, this is what you look for an entire ca career, to be able with a scientific publication to change the lives for thousands of patients immediately, not 10 years of drug development, but immediately. And maybe you can speak a little bit to the media attention uh, uh, this this, uh, yes. this got. Yes, and thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I'm yeah, getting yeah, excited yeah, about yeah, myself yeah, by yeah, listening to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but yes, it's it, it has been amazing, and it was actually the empowerment of the families which led to this uh, this identification. It was a mother, Austin Carrick from the United States, who reached me and said, "Have you seen all of these pictures of children with Down syndrome in the support group?" And I was like, "Yeah, but I didn't actually think about it." But she did, so she was a co-author of the paper. She don't have a medical background, but she's the mother, and she was helping writing the survey out. And after the survey results came back, we actually, uh, with a very, very um, strong scientific advisory board in KHI, were able to find a mice study, which actually found a potential explanation for why patients with Down syndrome would have low blood sugar, because they don't have the glycogen deposits like normal or healthy people do. So suddenly it would make sense, because you can't release the glycogen from, from the liver. And you see, I just want to uh, pause and just say something. I'm the medical person here, and she's the. Uh, just so you can see how much, how how far you can actually get if you involve patients. And 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 as I started by saying, Danielle knows much more about the disease than 90% of the doctors treating the disease. And and I think this is kind of a testimony uh, uh, to thank that. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, You're just like yeah. a proud dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But thank you. Do I look that old? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to comment yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah. But uh, but yes. Yeah, so so suddenly we would have an explanation also for why they would eat so much. That has been a med medical mystery for decades. Like why do they have to eat so much? Why do they end up with obesity? But if they are actually treating their low blood sugar and they are very intuitive and they know I have to eat to correct my hypoglycemia, that would be like wow then we have really failed as medical doctors 
these patients were actually showing us I have a problem and I'm self correct uh, I'm trying to 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 fix it but yes after the publication we were a bit <laughs> overwhelmed by the press because and the medical doctors who have been involved were also a bit overwhelmed because suddenly this I think the United States is a amazing place for press uh, so <laughs> yes so this uh, amazing mother Austin were out telling her story about how she has been dismissed by doctors and this led to a medical mystery it's suddenly being identified and now we have a scientific publication so we were featured in the NBC news in Apple news on the Today Show's website and we have been in national news in Denmark too and we had yeah and we have been contacted by the CNBC uh, because they're interested in see how can we how can we have an example about doing research the other way around? And this is what it's all about, trying to challenge the research paradigm. Can we push for a different research paradigm? We cannot do everything. We are not medical trained, but we can do something and we can actually do a lot. And if we have people like Jacob and my children's doctor who are supporting us and very open-minded that this is a learning process, not only Jacob teaching me, but I'm actually also teaching Jacob about the perspectives of the everyday life, then I really think that we can change research, not only in, in, in the hospitals, but also in pharma. Because especially with rare diseases, we can not only receive a rare disease diagnosis, we actually also need someone to fix us. We need the pharma companies, we need the medical industry to support us, because even with a genetic diagnosis, we cannot use that for anything. So after the, after the Down syndrome came, paper came out, we have also seen that the industry is suddenly interested in our patient group. They are interested to develop new treatment options for us, so we should not continue to live with this constantly <coughs> consuming huge amounts of cornstarch. That is very difficult for a child, and the quality of life is very, very challenged. Yeah. So you've spoken a lot to the why, yeah. uh, which is wonderful, and the most important thing. Just diving a bit into the how, because yeah. you have cracked the co code of how to use social media as yeah. a patient organization. And having worked with them for many years, I know that this is something most of them still yeah. are quite, uh, you know, walking around like yeah. warm porridge, as we say in Danish. So could you tell us a bit about, because it's quite low key what yeah. you've been doing. Actually, I'm just very good at notching people. So I just stalked the scientific experts I found on these research articles and I started sending them emails. Oh, do you want to be a part of this? I don't know where we are going, but I need you because you know something I don't know. So I went two, part, two paths. We need the scientific experts. We need that because we need to move somewhere. We cannot just simply do peer support. We need some solutions first. And then I started to community build on social media started to reach out in diabetes communities saying, oh, we suffer from low blood sugar, we don't have high blood sugar, but is anyone here who only suffer from low blood sugar? And actually we found, not only we found patients with idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia in these groups, we also found children with both type 1 diabetes and idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia, two diagnoses that is really, really challenging each other. And then on social media, it's all about sharing the why. And when we are sharing the why, we always reach someone who knows someone. So from being just me in Denmark, we are now 1,500 families from 65 countries, united in ketotic hypoglycemia support group. And our first conference united more than 1,000 people where 50% uh, uh, of them were healthcare professionals. So we are also seeing a willingness from the medical professionals to learn more and from the industry to learn more about this patient group because we are medical mystery and we are considered rare. We don't even have an ICD-10 code because they don't know what it is. We cannot be considered rare, but our symptoms are rare. So at the moment, we are trying to get clinical guidelines out to how to diagnose idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia and how to differentiate between the child who is mildly affected and the child who could die while sleeping. Jacob, if I was to ask you, what would be, how would you nudge some of your fellow researchers? Because you have 25 years of experience mm. in research. 
and I think most people with the same sort of same luggage of insights would consider, well, I don't need that much patient insights. I don't need patient involvement. I've, I'm, a, I'm the vet. Yeah. I, I think, first of all, uh, the, the latter part is a completely wrong statement. I think uh, what we say, we are here for the patients, and, and I, I know that most of people at Novo Nordisk, that's why they go to work. But where the chain falls off a little bit is how do we then get there to be there for the patients? And, and that's the part that we and medical doctors are maybe not as good as, as we could be. And that is uh, uh, through patient involvement. I, I think one of the successes that, that Dan, the reasons for Danielle's success has been that she has not been taking no for an answer. The dogma is that patients' organizations can't really be in the pocket of industry or they can't be controlled by doctors. You know, what she cared about was the patient that she was representing. And then whatever would get her to a better patient's rep representation and better patient treatment, she would pursue. And it didn't matter whether it was a pharma company or whether it was medical doctors. And I think it's those barriers where we kind of sit a little bit on the fence how much can we go in and, and work together with patient organizations? And the patient organization saying, you know, how much do we need to be in the uh, deep pockets of, of pharma industry? And that's just ludicrous. Like, deep pockets. Yeah, I don't yeah. receive any money. Yeah, no. Um, no, no, yeah. no, but that's what people, that's, what? no, exactly. But that's what many people are thinking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's those barriers to have much more patient involvement that we need to break down. Co-creation. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and then I think when patient comes to us with research they think are relevant, we should maybe listen more because often we will say, ah, they're not really scientists. Uh, and they will say, ah, we probably know better. We have 25 years of experience. Uh, I would rather talk to the doctor at the hospital. And, and I think that will change and it will change which is driven by social media because patients are becoming some of the best doctors themselves because they interact, they talk, they discuss. So I think the entire way we treat diseases is going to change in the future because you don't go to a doctor and ask for advice. You don't just listen to a pharma company saying this is a fantastic uh, drug. You talk to the patients that have been on that drug, have talked to that doctor, and that's how this is going to evolve to, to a place I don't even think we can begin to imagine today. Whereas now is the healthcare system represented by pharma and, and, the, and the hospitals and the doctors that are in the driver's seat, I think that's slowly going to change to being the patients. Or at least I hope it's slowly going to change because that's why we all go to, to, uh, to, to work every day, to serve the patients. And, and I have to say, I, I have a dream that, and I really, it, it's uh, because we are talking a lot about how doctors should lit listen to these patients and work with them, but I really, really believe that the pharma companies and the industry is a key stakeholder here. Where could we be if we, instead of talking about silos of public affairs and patient involvement and patient relations, and then we have R&D over here and we start to merge and think of it as a whole, then we can certainly start to see that we are developing not only something for the patients, but with the patients and by the patients. But you also identified, it, I wouldn't say a, a, a way to crack the code of compliance and business, business ethics, but you talk about the patient associations as the in-between, yeah. the neutral platform. Yes, it's suddenly actually okay to sit with Jacob for a doctor in the United States or a doctor in Denmark, because I am the host. And if it's my chairs and my table, then everyone can talk. But if I'm not there facilitating the chairs and the table, then we can't talk. Yeah. So, so we can be the host, we can be the facilitator. And that is where we really feel that we are not only strengthening our case, but also the, the relationships for the medical experts together with the medical experts in the industry. Because it's like, it's like there is this um, very outdated uh, perception that it's only medical doctors who are experts. We actually have amazing researchers and experts in the industry. That's why they are here. <laughs> We want to challenge that because we need both and we can make them work together in a different way that has been possible before. At least in a lot easier way because you all know when we are having KOL advisory boards how difficult it is to get legal approval and all the things you need to go through and that's why it is easier if we are invited to a patient organization where we all can talk in, in a compliant form uh, together. 
So time is up. Any questions from the room for the past last two minutes? Yes. Jutta? Uh, you also say cornstarch. How did you end up with cornstarch? How... Yeah. <laughs> cornstarch has been used for decades in children with glycogen storage diseases, which is a rare metabolic disease causing ketotic hypoglycemia. Cornstarch is the a slowest carbohydrate that will simply release slowly in the body. So the cornstarch is simply a, a long-acting sugar for our children. And a fun fact is that it's not approved as a medicine. It's no. no. So obviously. And you can imagine Daniel called up Thomas and Orwitz, the oh. head of the health uh, medicines agency, and told him we have a problem here. Yes. I, I'm inviting myself for coffee. Yes. And so she did. Yeah. Yes. So he's a very dear friend of mine today. Yeah. But yes, it was a problem because when I got my diagnosis, I tried to, um, to I needed to have a, a structure around me where I could take a different uh, education because I couldn't work as a pedagogue um, because of my hypoglycemia. But the government said, you're not sick because you don't take any medicines. And I was like, Okay, how do I make sure that I can get sick in your system then? Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, well, you need to may prove that the cornstarch is actually medicine. And I was like, okay, so when my children grow up and after the age of 18, they will be healthy, even with G-tubes yeah. and cornstarch in the G-tube. Yeah, because they don't get any drugs. So then I started to work with Thomas. <laughs> But also a lot of pharma companies like Nestle to ask if they could make cornstarch. Actually, at all... I don't know if you remember from, from I remember you, I was giving my kids cornstarch when they were small because then they slept through the night exactly for the same reasons. Yes. It tastes like freaking shit. I yes. mean to be honest. Cornstarch and, 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 porridge. And, yeah. and if you are on that every day many times a day it's a problem, right? So so Daniel has also been talking to some of the big manufacturers whether they could make something that maybe tastes a little bit better. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so so the we kids have, and uh, there is progress on that side, yeah, and yeah. we are very excited about that. Yeah. What if we could actually drink a yogurt or something yeah. that tastes nice? Okay. Um, actually, I think this, uh, the last discussion touches a bit on this question. You mentioned that you're actually working on international treatment guidelines for this. Yes. So it sounds like you're doing the job of the doctors uh, here to some extent. And I was just curious, how, how are you going about that? And the other thing is also, how do you then make sure, from your perspective, that it actually lives? Because this is one of the things that I'm working on public affairs today. Yeah where we can see there's, you know, great guidelines and it doesn't always trickle through, so how do you work with it? Well, I think we, uh, we took a giant leap when we started to unite the best medical doctors in the field of complex hypoglycemia. Because when these guidelines came out, uh, are coming out, they can't deny the fact that these experts are actually experts. Mm -hmm. And we, we published a baseline paper, which is the closest we have to a guideline, where we, for the first time ever, united the experts in the inborn era of metabolism and pediatric endocrinology. They are both seeing these children with idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia, but before they didn't really talk to each other. And that when we united them, we saw there were a lot of uh, areas where they didn't really agree. So the baseline paper came actually from a discussion around a table where we talked about what do we actually know what, what is still un unclear and what do we need to investigate further? And that baseline paper, it was, uh, uh, th that was the first uh, paper we published together. And that really showed us that when we are publishing something that is an urgent need for these patients, it will make a difference. Because suddenly these family who had been dismissed, some of them, some of the families had even had their children taken away because of a Mün Munchausen by proxy. Uh, accusation because the medical doctors couldn't actually they couldn't explain why the child would have ketotic hypoglycemia and some of these doctors are not very trained to to know all of these rare diseases obviously not <laughs> and, and known to cause ketotic hypoglycemia so they were suddenly able to take this scientific paper written by both patients but most importantly medical doctors who were recognized and very uh, on a very yeah international scale very recognized and they could take it to the doctors and say, look at this. This is not normal. Please help us. We need specialized care. So this paper started to be a door opener into specialized treatment for these families. So we call it the, the Bible in KHI, this baseline paper. 
but it's still just a paper. And when I'm saying we're working on the guidelines, to have guidelines, we actually need to have medical papers to, to support that. So we just need to write those first, and then we can get a clinical guideline. So we are in the process of that. Can we have one more question? Thanks so much for sharing that amazing story. I'm just so curious to, say, to, to understand a bit more about the research part, as you said, yes. to make it sound very easy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, when, and when we were with researchers, just the whole process of going through like ethical review boards and yes. whatever and academic institutions, I mean, how do you do that? When do you decide? Because otherwise, I guess you don't get your papers into the peer reviewed no. journals, right? I'm learning that as we're going. Is, uh, yeah. Quite tough. Yeah, the, the hypoglycemia dogs project, that's where the first time where I, I, I tried to write a, a protocol for the ethical committee yeah, and review. And I thought that was really, really exciting. And then I, every time we begin, I simply just begin. And then Jacob is like, oh, we also have to remember this. And I'm like, okay, we will remember this. And then he's like, oh, we have to do this. And then I'm like, okay, we will do that. So it's simply just a trial and error. And where do you go to? Which review board? I mean, which academic institution do you... Aarhus? Yeah, Odense, yeah, yeah, we are working with the Complex Hypoglycemia Center in Odense. Okay. And then we are working with uh, leading hypoglycemia clinics in the Netherlands, in the UK, and in the United States. So... And for the review board, it's the doctor's responsibility to, to, to go through the ethical committee. Yeah. yeah. But... but uh, not all doctors have, have done research like this, so we also need to, to sit together and help, you know, how do we do this in the yeah. smartest way. Yeah. But it's basically, this is where the do a cell rabbit comes in. <laughs> Danielle just continues until it gets done. You know, she doesn't take, oh, okay, we need to do ethical, oh, we can't do this clinical trial. She just kicks in doors and then things happens. And, and a lot of people, you know, when pe working together with people that have both a purpose and a strong passion, most people like that. Uh, and I think it also reflecting on our CEO, uh, Lars Fruergo, saying that if you have purpose, you have more or less everything, right? Mm -hmm. And Danielle has an extremely strong passion and purpose. And with those two go hand in hand, undoable things become doable, I can tell you. Things that I would thought, you know, even big organizations, uh, patient organizations, oh, this is not doable. A small, basically one-man army with, with some volunteers and, and, and some... Uh, volunteers, medics uh, uh, that are supporting it, it's amazing what they can do in their purpose and passion. But you never told me it was difficult. <laughs> no, 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 no. Then but that's, thought it yeah. was a very long process. Yeah, yeah. Senior <laughs> reviewed article, and Jakob was like, I've never heard about as quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have to ask for Katrin's permission because we have it. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, and I, I just want to say that yeah. one, uh, one of the... One of the big accomplishment of all of this we are doing is the fact that we can see that this is also not, it's not only a scientific paper on Down syndrome. We are waiting for the first pilot study in Denmark to be conducted to confirm the findings of the survey in a cohort of almost 100 children with Down syndrome in Denmark. So we are moving forward. So it's not simply just a publication, just like the baseline. It started with the baseline, saving, collecting everything we know now but then we are moving it to clinical guidelines. And so. I think you're also investigating the link to ADHD, right? Yes, we have a lot of research, uh, and that is uh, what we get when we are starting to identify patterns in a community on social media. We have a whole document about research topics we need to dive into. We just submitted an application to Helsefunden where we are investigating um, hypernursing as a term, children who are nursing like infants beyond the infant period as an early sign of ketotic hypoglycemia in children. So we have a lot of research projects that we need to dive into, but to do so, I have recognized the fact that we need, uh, we need more men on deck than yeah. me or yeah, women. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, we are working tirelessly always. And you'll have the shortest question. Yeah, it's, it's actually another question. Uh, you alluded to, to it, uh, Jacob, uh, with uh, Danielle's passion and, and drive and to a silver rabbit, and also that you had goosebumps. I just, it's just a very personal for me. I think it's really, really uh, inspiring. Thank so you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And you actually, because that would have been my last question, what drives you? And uh, I'm sure it's a combination of, uh, of this and this. Yeah, it's a, my, for, for me, it's passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. And then I use my brain to go where my heart tells me to go. Oh, you're yeah, so yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's 
So Danielle tells you where to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. She does all the time. So, uh, yeah. so thank you so much for yeah. joining us. And, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having us.